a really interactive session today and there'll be lots of group work that um, we'll be doing. In that group work, there's, there's really some advantage if you are from the same organisation to actually be in another group. So when we get to those activities, you might want to think about whether you want to stay with the group that you are or whether you might want to uh, spread out a little bit. There's a lot of information sharing that is going to happen in those um, uh, in those breakout activities, so um, make the most of them. So for the session today, you've also got some handouts uh, on your desk. Uh, you have a copy of the PowerPoint slides and you have uh, a series of activity sheets which we will uh, work through uh, throughout the session. Uh, we're also going to write onto the, the butcher's paper. The things that you're writing on the butcher's paper, we're going to take photographs of and share with the people who are in the online uh, session so that they can have the advantage or, or the benefit of um, the collective wisdom that actually sits in the in the room today as well. So when we ask you to run those, make sure you, you know it's big enough that we can actually take a photo of them and, and pop them online. So what will actually happen out of that recording process is that you'll also get sent a link to the session after you've completed the session. So uh, all of the information that comes from all of the, the groups and those photographs will actually be available uh, in that, that session. So you have this after session resource that you can um, refer to. Turning it on is always a good idea. So, down to business. So today we're here to uh, talk about industry engagement. And we do have one of those sectors where we are intrinsically linked uh, to industry when you, when you look at uh, the school sector and when you look at the higher education sector, none of them quite have the links with industry that we do in the vet sector. And so the importance of actually engaging with industry has been stressed for quite some time through our, our regulatory standards. And there's a number of places through the standards where it talks about industry engagement. Over the years, that uh, information that sits in those regular standards has been more and more specific about how they would like us to do that and what they would actually like us to do. So today's session at three hours is really focused on getting a clear understanding of what all those requirements are that sit in those regulatory standards and how we might then apply those to our very, very different businesses um, that we have. These are the topics that I'm planning on uh, addressing today. So we're going to look at industry engagement, the big picture of that, what is it? We'll have a look at why we actually engage with industry. Uh, we'll look at what do we actually have to achieve with this activity. This is a, a really key point, what are we actually trying to achieve with this activity because it kind of shapes everything that you might then do. So if we know what the outcome is that we're trying to achieve, we might look a little differently at that. Uh, we'll look at how we develop a strategy for industry engagement and you'll leave today with a, a draft of what you could do in your organisation. We will look at different methods of engagement. We'll look at record keeping and think more broadly about all the things that we discussed today, how that might actually work for us in our organisations. So this is one of those topics that, you know, like many, there isn't one answer for how industry engagement needs to happen. So the information that we talk about today, we, you know, we actually need you to take it and put it in the context of your own organisations. So this is a, a really typical thing that I see at audit all the time when people show me their evidence for industry engagement. I'll see a diary where someone's written down, I'm having a meeting with so-and-so. Um, at this time and it's a one hour meeting. I might see a form letter where sometimes they change the name, <laughs> sometimes they don't even change the name, the signature is different, which all says the same thing. Quite typical. So what's wrong with that as evidence of industry engagement? No specifics? No specifics? Yeah, a bit more detail. A bit more specific. <laughs> 
got the time and lucky enough to get the time to sit with industry and discuss with them. Yes. Um, you need to document what the um, outcomes are, like what you discussed in there, discuss the outcomes, what are the forward progressions and taking and what lessons can we take back into our um, training organisations. <laughs> um, what we're taking back into our organisations and how we'll actually apply that in our um, yeah. products. Yeah. yeah, so when you have a look at this, there are absolutely no specifics. We don't know what was talked about, what they looked at, what outcomes they achieved or how you might have used it as, as an organisation. So when we see things like, like this, we actually don't know what the outcome of your industry engagement was and we really want to move away from that. So we have to have really a common definition of what industry engagement is and that's your first task in your groups. So you've got five minutes in your group to come up with a definition of industry engagement. You might like to think about it as, you know, maybe I'm a new person who's working for your organisation, I've never heard of this before. How are you going to explain to me what industry engagement is? In your groups, on your butcher's paper, please. So while while we are talking, our online counterparts are also going to write some of their definitions in the chat box. Awesome. And Bob is going to let us know what those definitions are. So we've got a bit of a mix from, from everywhere. So here's a word of warning. I'm going to ask for volunteers. And if you don't volunteer, I'm going to volunteer you. <laughs> so, so in each of our activities, I'll, I'll, we'll ask for um, volunteers. So who would like to... Ask the first thing. Thank you. <laughs> okay, hi Sharon. Going out to industry to learn their practices, using it to inform our training and assessment, getting industry to review our training and assessment materials to make sure it means their requirements um, mutually beneficial, meets their requirements, and it's mutually. mutually beneficial. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. What about this group? So maybe if you come up and if you stand about here, then they can they can actually focus on the on the actual piece of paper. Yeah. Yeah, I'll swap you. Okay. I'm Carrie from Wise Click Training in Balcatta. So we just went through industry engagement is more than just contact consultation with industry contacts to find out current trends in our industry sector, how it works and how they are applied, how we can meet newcomers' needs and what we need to do to meet the gaps in our training packages, methods, etc. How to fit and comply with units of study. <laughs> so, and that all comes together to be industry engagement is fact finding to track current and future trends in our industry to improve and keep up in our training delivery. Okay. Okay, thank you. What about the group at the back? A two-way conversation with key stakeholders that investigates an organisation's training needs, including the skills and knowledge to achieve required outcomes. Fantastic, thank you. A oh, wordsmith. We had to look at the wordsmiths. Uh, what about this group at the back? You're next. Hello, I'm Ken from Futura Skills, uh, and we put a keyword up there: relationship. Uh, whether it's client or whether it's an industry representative. And the other thing we did was create an acronym, CCCC. Um, so, uh, no acronyms here. Um, so, we're looking at currency, content, contextualisation, and customisation. We get all of that from industry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Middle group. <laughs> a 
Okay. Um, we probably came to similar conclusions as everybody else, although some of the things that we were uh, very clear, clear about was that it's a two-way process um, and that sometimes it's also about understanding where trends may have changed in the industry so that we make sure that we are current um, and also making sure that um, industry's expectations are also mitigated by what we really have to offer. Um, sometimes their expectations may be greater um, or inflated to what we, we, we may offer. So they may think that it, what, what comes out of a Cert 2 um, is probably more like what comes out of a Cert 4 or things like that mm. as well. So the consultation is about um, reconciling all expectations and where industry is requiring us um, to, do, uh, to deliver mm. professionalism. Mm. Really? Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bob, you got another one? Yes, I do have another one. Um, this one's from Erin at Ocean Earth Training. Um, assuring training and assessments meet industry needs and requirements. Okay. 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 So there's some very common things coming through. In, oh. Did you want another one? Yes, please. Anthony Evans says, talking to industry stakeholders with the view of ensuring that your assessment practices have outcomes for students that meet the needs of industry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of common themes there in what you're saying. So the things that, that came through to me were that it's a relationship, it's a two-way relationship, and by implication is an active process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is about making sure that our stakeholders' needs are met, whoever they might be. So we're talking about students, we're talking about employers and potentially other bodies as well who may have an interest in what it is that we're doing. That it's a mutually beneficial relationship in that information comes to us but information uh, about what we do also goes to, to the person that we are talking to. It is about ensuring that we meet a standard and having clarity around that what that standard is and that it addresses many aspects of our business. So not simply the training and assessment, but other things that we do as well. Have I missed anything? Good answer. <laughs> okay. So the other thing that has changed in our regulation is we, uh, we used to use the word consultation a lot, and now they use the word engagement. Why do you think that is? Why have we moved away from consultation and used the word engagement? Consultation could be one-sided. Engagement is multiple people giving their um, opinions yeah. and yeah. coming to outcomes. Yes. So fundamentally, there's an implication saying engagement that is far more collaborative. Far more collaborative. More ongoing as well. Yeah, yes. Is that term? Sorry, Mark, sorry, we can't hear you out. <laughs> That's the idea of it. <laughs> <laughs> You're right. Um, can't remember what I was going to say. All right, consult um, sorry, engagement is yeah. more um, long term. Yes. Yeah, so it keeps yes. them yes. Yeah, in there. Exactly. So it's not a once-off touch point or that sporadic touch point that you can sometimes get with consultation, but it's more of an ongoing relationship that you might have with an organisation to make sure that that exchange of information is actually happening. So the other thing that they do, and it's a question that we often uh, have, and it was certainly in a lot of the questions that um, were sent through to us prior to this workshop, is what about if we're an enterprise RTO? Like, is it enough that we just talk to our own people? And so I guess that really uh, is the difference between what is employer engagement and what is industry engagement. So we deliver nationally recognised qualifications, which as an employer, you might decide is suitable for the people who work within your organisation. And it's fabulous while they're there with you. But those people can also take that qualification anywhere else that they might choose to go. So when we look at our engagement activities, we're looking for that broader industry engagement rather than specific employer. So we don't want you to just talk to your own operational people. You need to talk more broadly to, to industry. So 
of this word, stakeholders, has come up a number of times uh, already in the conversation that, that we've had. Who are the stakeholders in your business? And across all the different uh, work that I, that I do, including the audits that I do for TAC, one of the questions that I will often uh, ask people is who are the stakeholders in your business? And you would be stunned, as I'm stunned, how many people actually can't answer that question. They don't truly know who the stakeholders in their business are. So when we think about are we producing an end product that's going to meet the needs of these stakeholders, it's pretty hard to do that if we actually don't know who it is we're supposed to be uh, engaging with. And the other thing is that they're not all equal. People will have differing interests in what you do. So understanding what their interest is then helps you to shape how you might engage with those people. So another activity for you. I did warn you we're going to have a very interactive session. Uh, you have a brainstorm uh, that you're going to conduct. Again, you've got some butcher's paper in front of you. The online people, I want you to do this activity the same as the people here. And what I want you to do in your groups is to brainstorm all the stakeholders for your business. So they, because you're in mixed groups, obviously, there'll be people on those lists that aren't necessarily a stakeholder for you, but will be a stakeholder for other people in your group. So we just want a big list, stakeholders in your businesses. So we, we might start with this group down the front this time. Uh, hi, my name's Mick. I'm from Construction Skills Training Centre. Mel. <laughs> we did. Our, our brainstorming sort of looked at what we all do in industry because we work in the same place. So we looked at firstly, yes, students and employers. Then we started to look at regulators, so WorkSafe, SafeWork Australia. We looked at local councils and government, um, unions, job search agencies, and that's in line with Centrelink as well, that we get a lot of requests. Uh, industry councils, we look at different companies, builders, developers, and then we looked at just regulators Australia-wide, and because we do traffic control, we looked at Main Roads, Western Australia, and the Australian National Road Council. Okay. Excellent, thank you. Group at the back. Um, we had uh, shareholders of the RTO, so one of our um, RTOs is a publicly listed company on the ASX, so they have shareholders. We've got private shareholders of the RTO as well, so you need to consider those. Obviously the clients, who you're going to market your business to, the workforce of the RTO, so that's staff, cleaners, landlords, everything that falls underneath that uh, component, trainers and assessors, the students themselves, uh, employers of the students. So we talked about industry uh, consultation before, but who are you going to, these students get work for, you need to consult with them and know them. Industry associations and the end user or the consumer of your, your product that you're training and delivering in. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, We'll get there. <laughs> <coughs> okay, got some very um, similar ones, but um, we do a lot of stuff with schools. So we had obviously our students, our schools, parents, teachers, our employers of our trainees and apprentices, but also employers. Um, in industry, training regulators, industry bodies, um, people who fund us and where we get our, them from, professional associations, end user, um, our staff who we work with, our colleagues, the community, TAFEs, um, yeah, mm. government, <laughs> a mm. lot, yeah. A lot, exactly, yeah. that's exactly the point. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and what about some from our online people? Okay, so maybe if you could pick out ones that are different, Bob, just to make your job a little harder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Natalie, um, first up, said creditors, directors, employees, 
government and its agencies, mm -hmm. owners, shareholders, suppliers, unions, and the community from which the business draw its resources. Yeah. Judy from North Regional says SSO, so that's the state, yeah. um, state training councils, national and state regulatory bodies, yeah. employers, unions and industry. Yeah. Um, Sharon says DTWD because they fund TAFE, yeah. students, employers, community agencies, etc. Mm -hmm. And she also mentions IRCs, yeah. TAC, ASQA. Apprenticeship and traineeship bodies. Uh, Anthony yeah. says, specific to our industry, technical writer, technical writing, web administrator, web developers and admin, web designers, developers, page developers, site developers, and webmasters. Yeah. Just to mention, I'm from IT training in TAFE. <laughs> we we kind of guessed that, Anthony. We got that. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. So. The reality is when we look at the lists that we have created, we have this plethora of people that we are supposed to engage with. So how do we actually come up with a plan to engage with all these different people who have such varied interests in what it is we do? I might have a little solution for you. It is often useful to then think about your stakeholders in terms of what interests they have in your business and what influence you have in your, biz in the, in your business. So, you know, we are all uh, time poor people. We, we have busy jobs, busy lives, and we have to make the most of the time that we have to, to do these activities. <clears throat> so what we're suggesting is that you would not engage with all of these people in the same way. For some people who have uh, low influence and low interest in what it is you do, there's a minimal effort involved there and it's really just an informing and potentially could be quite passive. For those people who have high influence, high interest in your business, they're the kind of people that you actually want to work together with. So it's going to be a far more collaborative type approach that you might use with those type of people. So being able to categorise your stakeholders into this kind of framework then helps us think about if this is the kind of stakeholder they are, then this is the kind of engagement activity that would suit for those people. So. In your handouts, you have a blank one of those matrices. What I'd like you to do now is to go back to your lists and slot those people in where you think they might fit. Now, you're not all going to put the same people in the same boxes. So for some people who have public funding, they are people, for example, that you must keep satisfied. For those of you who don't have public funding, they're not even going to appear in your matrix. Okay? So this is where you take this big list of information, bring it back to you and say, where do these people apply to me? How do they fit for me? Same for the online people. Use your matrix to go back to your list and slot in your stakeholders where they fit. And we have uh, about 10 minutes to do that activity. So as you went through that activity, what did you find? Easy to put people into categories? No. Yeah. No. 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 Yes. And why? Why wasn't it easy? You don't want to put one above the other. I mean, if they're a stakeholder in your business, they're there for a reason. Yeah. So, you know, how do you actually mm -hmm. not segregate, or I guess segregate, mm -hmm. but also put in in a hierarchy mm -hmm. who's more important than the other? Mm -hmm. Because although somebody might have a one percent interest in your business, mm -hmm. that one percent is still one percent, and mm -hmm. it's still critical. It's yeah. one percent is it? Yes. Yeah, so yes. it's a bit, yeah, no, it wasn't easy. Okay. So, so you've raised an interesting point in terms of is this 
is this telling us who is more important than and another? No, well, it's not more no. Important. no. It's the importance that you place on the relationship. Yes, or maybe not the importance of the relationship, but the nature of the relationship. Okay. So the okay. nature of the relationships are different. The nature of the relationships are different. So it means that we tend to them in a different way. So, so that's really the, the, the point that I want to come across is that we pick what's best suited to the relationship rather than applying a bit of a blanket type approach, which is often what we see in RTOs. We get this one size fits all <laughs> and it never does. It never, ever does. Thank you. Anyone else might comment on that activity? Uh, yes. Yeah. Every single one of our businesses are very different. Therefore, yeah. the people we engage with are different. And yeah. We put different priorities yeah. on where we place those engagements. Yes, indeed, exactly. And there will be different times in what you're doing where that matrix will change. So you might, for example, uh, you know, win a contract to do a special project, in which case your whole matrix will change for, for a time, like it is a tool that is an ongoing tool that you will use in your business. Exactly. Now, you mentioned something very interesting too around, you did. <laughs> <laughs> what did I mention? Around yeah. that in terms of putting those people in those boxes didn't mean that you would always engage with them in the same way even though they still stayed within the box. Um, and the treatment for each each yeah. of them might be different as well. So in our particular context, for, and actually a very good point was raised too, that you could have the same stakeholder represented in more than one mat part of the matrix yeah. too. Yeah. So uh, if in our particular instance, we have quite a lot of stakeholders who were parents, yeah. some of whom would be high interest and high influence, yeah. um, whereas others, they have no idea what's going on in that room. Uh -huh. So the, the way that we would treat that would be very different depending yeah. on the yeah. needs of that particular yeah. Part, not just we can't blanket out a stakeholder and say we're going to treat you all the same way because you appear mm. in this part of the mm. matrix. Mm. Is that what you wanted? Yeah. <laughs> sure. No pressure. <laughs> it is exactly what I wanted. <laughs> so the reality is that you in fact have a little tool that you can use here that is a, to help you organise and think about how you might engage with the different groups of people who have interest and influence in your business. So we're going to pop that matrix away and we're going to keep it for uh, an activity in a, in a couple of minutes. Well, actually, probably after we have our morning tea feast, actually. <laughs> so the, uh, we've talked about who might might be involved and the, the next thing is to really to think about what it is we have to achieve in this process and that's not 100% clear for many many people. So we have a set of regulatory standards that address really the entire running of an RTO. There's focus on training and assessment in there, there is focus on the client services type activities that you might engage with and there's also focus on how you run your RTO in those standards. And the reality is industry engagement is sprinkled throughout. So we tend to focus on two particular clauses in there where they explicitly mention industry engagement. And that's 1.5 and 1.6. But when you have a look at the rest of the standards, there are in fact lots of places through those standards where engagement with industry is important. And that's what I want you to do now is to have a look at those. So activity three is a blank table which you are going to fill out. So on your desks you will have a couple of copies of the regulatory standards. And what I want you to do in your groups <laughs> so if I can, so can I just have your attention back for a minute while I tell you what I want you to do. And I love that you're so enthusiastic and want to get into it. <laughs> but I need you to come back here. So we have 
uh, one column where we want you to note down the standards that you feel are relevant in regards to industry engagement. They're not all going to be relevant. So which ones do you think are relevant and why? How are these standards actually related to industry engagement so we can then figure out what questions we might need to, to ask? Okay, Which standards, how are they relevant to industry engagement? So, as you went through that activity and considered what was uh, written in the regulatory standards, what did you discover? <laughs> it's everywhere. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. So when you think about the activities that occur in your RTO and the kind of engagement, the reality is as you do your daily business, there are actually things that you will engage in in different ways, granted, and with different people, but all throughout what it is you do on a day-to-day -day basis, you're going to find that there is linked to engagement activities. And this is the point in this exercise, is in fact that rather than um, focusing on what do we have to do for 1.5 and 1.6, which is what lots of RTOs do, you know, it's a very, very common thing, is actually to think much more broadly about the kinds of outcomes that the standards are actually asking you to achieve and look at the themes that sit through those standards. And when you do that, you'll be focused on the outcome rather than compliance and you will get better results. So many people, you know, just wanted some clarity around vocational competence and industry currency. What is the difference between those things? So our standards say that if you're going to train and assess, there's a few things that need to be in place. One of which is you must have vocational competencies, at least to the level that is being delivered and assessed, and you must have current industry skills that are directly relevant to the training and assessment being provided. So what they're saying is they want you to have the industry qualification or equivalent and they want you to have skills and knowledge that actually reflects current industry practice. Now, for whatever reason, this is really problematic for people what these two things mean. So we'll have a little bit of a, a closer look. So we want you to have industry knowledge and experience in the units of competency that you are going to deliver and assess. The reason that we look at that uh, at a unit level is when you think of how our training packages are structured, we have a model which encourages flexibility. So we will have some core units and we'll have uh, elective units. The number of elective units in qualifications varies dramatically. Some qualifications it's one, some qualifications the entire qualification is elective. So when you actually have a, a look and say, has someone got the knowledge and skills that they need to be able to deliver in this qualification, you actually need to look at unit level to, to make that decision. So vocational competence is sometimes about having the qualification itself, the units of competence themselves. But it can also be demonstrated by your experience within industry. So when you're going through that process of saying, I need to actually prove that someone is competent, they don't hold the unit of competency that they're delivering and assessing in, we're going to have to look at something else. You have to make sure that the person who's looking at the something else actually knows what they're looking at. And I think when you think about it in those terms, it's actually quite logical that you would so do you, that. So you actually would have to send in to... <coughs> so when you're, when you're assessing a new trainer and yeah. you want them to come in yeah. and they say, but I've got a degree yeah. and, but, and I've done this, this and this, mm -hmm. and say, well, okay, show us how you've done that. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, that business is gone, finished now. Mm -hmm. or, uh, unless you can sit them down with a little exam, it's very hard to get that, that mm. how do I know that person 
didn't do that degree 25 years ago and hasn't done one single thing since. Exactly. So how do you prove to an auditor when they come in and say, are your trainers industry competent to train? Mm -hmm. It's really tricky. We had a consultant who was really good hands-on practical consulting mm. and in the end we had to go back and get all her on-site notes and photocopy and scan all those mm. and show mm. that she was able mm. to teach in that mm. because she'd had a very outdated, very old degree yeah. qualification. Yeah. Yeah. So. That was the yes. only way, but we were lucky. We had a consulting arm of our business that could do it, but yes. it would have been really hard. Yes, and sometimes think about your students and your, uh, you're in essence doing the same thing. You're making a judgment about whether your student is competent. How would you do that? Would you be happy to do that based on a resume? No, of course not, of course not. And that is, in fact, what you're saying about your lecturers. You're saying this lecturer is competent to deliver this unit of competency. And here's my proof. And here is my proof, whatever that proof may be. Same kind of process. Same kind of process. Same thing. We run our similar to an RPL process. Yep, same kind of process, exactly, Amanda. You're just really yep. mapping and looking what people have. Yeah. Yeah, and whether it's actually relevant. I saw a great one a while ago in the automotive industry where the person had come out of the Air Force, you know, so, and it was to do with the avionics type um, systems in the, and this person had worked on like the weapon systems on aircraft. And But when you had a look at the evidence that was sitting in the mapping that they'd done, it was about, you know, you know, back 40 missiles and da 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 and I'm going, okay, you're actually going to do this on a Qantas jet. <laughs> I can't remember when I saw a Qantas jet flying over with missiles attached to its underbelly. It might have been relevant, absolutely might have been relevant, but we actually needed a knowledgeable person to look at that and say that is relevant and it, it, it means that they can deal with what's in the unit. An extreme example, but same kind of thing, same kind of thing. So again, as we've talked about with industry consultation, it's about thinking about the outcome. Prove that the lecturer is competent to do what you're asking them to do. And industry currency is about being able to do it now. So exactly as you said, you know, I did my degree 20 years ago. I might have gone off and done all kinds of different things. Can I do it today? So a lot of the traditional trades are areas where, you know, a trade certificate has been done some time ago and it's about whether they've kept up with, you know, practice. So again, we used the automotive example yesterday, you know, I might have been an auto mechanic and, and I've worked on um, particular types of engines all my life because I'm a bit of a, a, a car buff and I like vintage cars and I'm working on carbureted engines, which apparently they don't make anymore. <laughs> But when you have a look at the engines of today, we're talking about electric engines, we're talking about diesel engines, which have you know migrated to our domestic passenger vehicles now. So does that you know mechanic who who had his qualification all those years ago does he understand and, and know all of the things that he needs to to service the electric engine that gets pulled into the shop? Does he understand all the software tools that are then linked to these new types of cars? That's industry currency stuff. So one thing is you can do it, vocational competence. The second thing is you can do it how it's done now in industry. And they're the two things that as an organisation you're proving. And when you look at standard 1.6 or clause 1.6 I should say, it specifically talks about using your engagement activities to assure the currency of your trainers and assessors. So, as we've talked about industry engagement, um, we've talked about, you know, we're making sure that we're offering the service that our stakeholders really need, that we're ensuring through those activities that we're meeting a standard that's actually suitable for the workplace, that we are making sure that those activities are done by people who actually know what they're doing and can do it. And we check to see that, in fact, 
after we've done it, we've done it well and it worked as we hoped it would. So that's quite a lot to actually get answers to. And this might be a point for those of you who know me, where you go, it's finally happened. Claire's lost the plot. She regressed to her childhood, back into Alice in Wonderland, to a situation where Alice comes to a crossroads and she meets the Cheshire cat. And she actually says to the cat, would you tell me which way to go? And the Cheshire cat says, well, that depends a good deal on where you want to get to. And she says, well, I don't much care where. And the cat says, then it doesn't matter which way you go. And Alice clarifies it and she says, but I do want to get somewhere. And the cat says, well, you're bound to do that as long as you walk long enough. So this is actually a fairly typical situation that we see with industry engagement. That question is the question that RTOs can't answer. They can't say what they're trying to achieve with their industry engagement activities. So they don't ask the right questions when they are actually face to face with their stakeholders. And what happens is that sometimes you all get somewhere, um, but it's not necessarily the place you want to be. And if you do get to a place you want to be, it is often by good luck rather than good management that you've actually arrived in that place. So what we want in your organisation is for you to have a really clear strategy about what it is you're trying to achieve and how you're actually going to go about doing that. And that's what the rest of the morning uh, and early afternoon is about, is how we set up that strategy for industry engagement for your organisations. So when we're talking about strategy, we're talking about the what, where, when, who and how type questions that we actually need to answer. Now we've been dabbling a little bit in those already. We've already talked a little bit about who our stakeholders uh, might be and how they might influence us. The next activities that we do are actually about asking uh, the rest of those questions. And we're going to do a rotating brainstorm activity and this is where our online people are going to deviate a little bit from what we are doing um, here. On your desks, you've got, an, it's actually an A3 sheet that you've got on your desks that looks a bit like this. So on that um, sheet, what you've got is a standard number down the side and then you have what questions would we actually need answers for. Okay, and that's the column I want you to focus on, Okay, only that column. What questions do we need answers for? So the previous exercise where we did where we said these are the parts of the standards that are relevant to industry engagement. I want you to think more deeply and think about when you actually go and talk to industry, engage with them, what questions might you ask? And I've given you a bit of an example there. So when we talk about, for example, our training and assessment strategies, often what happens is uh, the RTO will send a completed strategy to industry and say, this is our strategy, would you endorse it? And we get an email back like that one saying, Dear John, we agree with your strategy. Not really engagement. However, if you start to think about what it is you actually want answers to when you engage with industry, you will have a different outcome. For example, what units would match the tasks in the workplace and provide the best employment outcomes for these students? Or what knowledge and skills might the target group that I'm aiming at already have? Or what concerns do industry in general have with the knowledge and skills of workers in their workplaces? Or what knowledge and skills are actually critical for employees of the future? So these are just a few sample questions to get you thinking. So when you are looking at those different uh, standards that are relevant to industry engagement, 
and you're going to go and talk to someone, what questions do you need answers for? Okay. Now, I'm going to allocate some different clauses to the different groups so that we get a broader view of what uh, we might, so we're not all working on the same thing. <coughs> So this group, I want you to do one, one and one, two. This group, I want you to do one, three and one, seven. Okay. This group, I'd like you to do uh, one, eight. This group, I'd like you to do 2.2. .2. Okay. This group, I'd like you to do one, 13 and one, 16. And this group, I actually want you to think about the marketing standards. So think about four and five, okay? All right. So the people who are the people who are online will go through the same activity. You can pick the standard that you would like to work on. Brainstorm questions that you would ask or need answers to when you're engaging with industry for the standard of your choice and you need to write this on the butcher's paper okay and, <laughs> and it should take you about 15 to 20 minutes to do this okay off you go just the question Okay, so you all have a series of questions on your desk that are around the particular standards that you have looked at. And we need to share that information with everyone else. So we're going to rotate a little bit. So in your groups, you need to pick one person who is going to stay at your table and explain your discussion and your points that you have put on your sheets to the people that come to visit you. So that's the first thing. Pick the person who's going to stay and explain. Now the rest of you, the rest of the people from your table are each going to move to a different table. So four people on this group, one person stays, the three of you will each go to a different table. The idea is that you spread out and get as much information as possible. When you go to that other table, your job, your job as the visitor, take notes, ask questions. Learn as much as you can from the discussion that was had in the other group. Okay? So um, we did clause 2.2. Um, so basically, the first part is about systematically monitoring the RTO's training and assessment strategies and practices to ensure ongoing compliance with Standard 1. So some of the questions that we came up with were basically based on the components of a test. So were the resources adequate? Were the hours of delivery sufficient? Was RPL offered? Did the trainers and assessors have the current knowledge and skills to offer the training assessment? Has um, has there been changes in legislation uh, since the TAS was written? Where um, was LLM then offered or support? Were the requirements of the clause clearly outlined? And were the assessment requirements or process explained? That's what we managed to get through in our time. We had some very fruitful conversation. <laughs> I've summarised that TAS metric shows compliance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's really what you're doing because, like, I know um, at my department, we, we, at my section on management for learning development, we look after the department's licence registration. So our, our main stakeholder is people in our agency that are delivering training products in their own business unit. So what we do is we negotiate the TAS and everything with them. We take it to our learning development steering committee, which is made up of the director general and the directors, and then what we do is we go back out and we audit asked the people that are offering the training and assessment against the TAS that was initially negotiated. So we'll look at the TAS and go, okay, you said that you're offering the training over 10 hours. Was the training offered over 10 hours? You said that you were going to 
the assessment was going to be conducted in this fashion? Was it conducted in this fashion? You said the physical resources you're going to use, are these, were they? That sort of stuff. And then what we do, we'd also ask the learners, the people who attended the training, to so be asking, okay, did they explain the assessment process to you clearly? And so you'd be getting both sides. You wouldn't be just getting the trainer and assessor side. You'd be getting the students or the people that attended's opinion. Yeah, did they offer you this? Did they offer you uh, assistance in the, in the learning? And that's a problem I have where I've got the tasks, I've got the, you know, all the tools, and then trainers get stuff and they just run off on their own tangent because they just run off doing what they've always done or what they see is important and they don't understand what the requirements of the unit of competence. Oh, I don't need that because I've got that. Yeah, but the unit of competence says this, so you have to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> That's why we pay them the big bucks. You know, they're, they're supposed to be able to develop this stuff and they can't even tick the right boxes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 What about you guys? What do you guys do with that? Um, so we're, we've got quite a few arms of our business. So when we develop the TAS, we obviously, we've got a board of directors who are very much heavily influenced in, in or industry members. So we would always take the TAS and liaise with them basically in the creation of our TAS. And then um, when we go to go out to our industry and to do like um, see our apprentices and stuff in the in the workplace, we would um, talk to them about it and get their feedback. And But they're not essentially as involved in the creation of it. I'd say more our board members and those kind of – and our – trainers and assessors who are still working in industry as well are the main people that are involved in the creation of the task and then it's more consultation like more a, like a showing and checking that it's all going well with industry and yeah one thing I did just pick up is that we should something that we should be doing and we're not doing is we also deal with auspicing with schools and we should be in create um Creating relationships with our TAS development with them as well from that, which I just put On a previous one of these, Claire said that compliance is not just having the correct paperwork, but it is the correct delivery and assessment of the unit of competence. So I can have the correct paperwork, and if my trainers are running off doing something else, yeah. I'm not compliant. Yeah. And they don't realise they're putting my business in my house on the yeah. line and they run off and do what they're doing because they know everything. Yeah. I think the thing that we've learned in our business is that the training and assessment strategy, like in line with this standard, is a live document. Yeah. It's not so like a business case that gets negotiated and approved by your board to start with. It yeah. should be monitored all the time. And then if it needs updating, yeah. it's actually a live document. Yeah. I think yeah. that's where we've gone wrong in the past. And that's why we've changed how we do it. Yeah. Yes, and, and there are legislative requirements. They're the sort of questions you need to ask. If legislative requirements have changed, and we need to update and review the TAS to make sure it's reflecting what legislation is saying, saying in the training. Yeah. Yeah. Because often what happens otherwise is you get, you do your TAS, and that's endorsed, and you put it up to ASPRA, and you get a, well, we're ASPRA, it gets approved, but then if no one's reviewing to make sure that's how it's being offered, because we have yeah. multiple people in our agency providing the same product, training product, product to different right. people, yeah, yeah, yeah. we want it all to be the same, yeah. so it's a standardised yeah. process. Because they can all, some of them can put different things in and take different things out, I'm more comfortable talking about this or, or delivering this part, but not that one. Because we have the same qualification being delivered in a very um, variety of different ways. So we have to have, we have different houses working with them because it's completely different the way. So the way. Was, yeah. So yeah. it's not just you're saying it's different trainers teach in different ways, but then you've got different end users as well that you've got to cater for. So that's what we do. We have this, the training products. So we might say it's a search to and CLM, but we've got two different areas of the department offering two different programs against the training product. Yeah. So different target audience. Yeah. So we have to contextualise the TAS for that target audience as opposed to the other. You, know, you can't have one test, one training product. No. That's separate. Yeah. Reasonable adjustment. So yeah. Yeah. And that's your, your fair and flexibility out of your principal assessment to show that you are catering for different people with different needs. Yeah. So and then what our group did, more. what our group did too, is we, we were looking at that from the the perspective that are our trainers and assessors offering as per the TAS, but then we also look from the students' perspective. So what are the questions that we ask our learners that have gone to the training that indicates it was delivered as per the training assessment? So it seems like were you involved in the evaluation process? You know, were you asked for feedback? You know, um, you know, when the assessment instructions were given, were they clear and was that how the assessment was rolled out? We asked and attended.
uh, ask questions of, of it before you did it. Yeah. Because yeah. sometimes they can just, if they just say it, are they understanding it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and we did we did briefly look at Part B, which is systematically uh, evaluated um, and uses the outcomes of the evaluation to continually improve the RTO training and assessment strategies and practices. And evaluation, evaluation information includes, but is not limited to quality performance indicator data collected under Clause 7.5. Um, that's the bit I was saying that we talked about is the TAS being a live document so when the feedback comes in from the stakeholders going back Change and it. updating yeah. it version two version three yeah that, that's what we how we do it is that how you guys do it yeah yeah we different kinds and we um we have like a bit at the end it says um when the delays on what's come out of that um consultation or engagement process and then how we've used that to adapt our training, our training is all right. So the next step in this process is to move back to your original tables and to share the information that you gained at all of the other tables with your original group. So you'll end up with more questions uh, in your list. And potentially you will refine maybe some of the questions that you had because in many of the groups, um, as you talked about the questions, you had some suggestions for improvement, refinement uh, or additional questions as well. So back to your groups uh, to do that. And I also want you to think about this next question as well. So now you have all these questions that you want to ask. You think about who's the best person to ask that to. So you can fill out the next column of your matrix as well. That should take you about 20 minutes. Who wants to go first of what you found? What questions? Okay, if you like. Yeah, to so your Yep, standard four. You want us to read the standard out first? Oh, hang on, I'll just take a minute. Where are we? Four. Four, accurate and accessible information about an RTO, its services and performance is available to inform prospective and current learners and clients. So they, their question was, is the information we have advertised provide you with enough information for course cost, duration and times, outcomes, prerequisites, pathways, qualification, location, course content and type of delivery? No. How do you answer that question? That's a, that's a question. That's a question. Oh, no. It needs to be broken down. That's not a question. I could just look at that and go, the. I don't know what to write to write. One question B is the information we have advertised provides you with enough information on duration and times. I think well, that's what's to make a, an to make a decision on So we can adapt what they put, can't we? We can yeah. do so is the information advertised uh, is the information we've advertised provide you with enough information for They've covered everything that's in the standard. They've just basically gone through. Oh, straight down there. Yeah, because yeah. it says that it provides it on it's on scope. So they, you know, um, four rather than one point four. They're supposed to do one point four, were they? No, I don't know. Which is quite large. You look at it. That's, yeah, what, that's what they have covered. Or four point one. No, I think they got more. Yeah, and particularly because the industry they said that they were from was that they'd all just been through an audit with these two standards. Okay. Focused. So that's why. So they're probably highly sensitive to making sure that it's comprehensive. comprehensive. You need to have a bit of a broader question, I think, rather than specify all of those. Yes, I, know, I think that what is a slightly different group than what they were. So is it for advertised provide you? Does it? Does. So that could be through web advertised provide you with um, enough info for. For time, and well, they've, they've got a lot. Cost, times. See, outcomes is broad. What do they mean by outcomes? Well, that's right. It has to be specified what what their intent is before you. Yeah, can exactly. Prerequisites. So. And are we asking an, a potential stakeholder? i.e. a student or an employer, 
who okay, were students, my apologies, they were focused at students. At students, okay. Okay, well that's so, fair enough. So the information on their website or in their flyers, is there sufficient evidence for these things? For, yeah, for to them these to be able to within this yeah. side right. Right. Sorry, I thought okay. I said that, my apologies. Yeah. Okay. Cost, yeah. duration, outcomes, prerequisites, pathways. But again, for a student, that would need to be broken down. Sure, oh, yeah. 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 Um, Although when you when you do orientations and inductions and things like that, you would you would you would actually cover all of those yeah. Yeah. or your handbooks and things. But like the standard that. does say prior to enrolment. Well, that's what I mean. The yes. Moment. And they did say in the next standard five is where they talk about the student handbook. So okay, so right. what were five? Okay, five. So prior okay. to the course. Sorry, what did you say? Prior to the course. This is for five. Did you receive information about? It goes along the same track as two, standard four. <laughs> uh, so did they receive information? About, which is interesting. That so, did you receive information about the student handbook? The student handbook is full of information. No, well, so that's interesting. They wrote that down. Did you receive correct information in the handbook? Yes. yes. But don't you get a handbook once you're enrolled? Yes, yes. But this is standard five. Oh, that's yeah, five. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, yeah. This is all about prior to enrolment. No, this is standard five. So now it's actually about enrolment. Uh, enrolled. But one five point one says prior to enrolment, and so does five point two. Yeah, it does too. They're not. They're prior to enrolment. Have you they received are. sufficient information regarding the outcomes of the course, the pathways, the costs, etc. Um, for you to make an informed decision, do you want to do the training? Yeah. Because it's about yes. making an informed decision. And it's about protecting the. Um, I guess some to your, uh, to your the rights of the person who's. Some RTOs might be happy to give out their handbook prior to enrolment. We don't. I don't know. Specific industry. By the time, though, that you've ended up that fifth, that, uh, standard five. Uh, the students are definitely enrolled by the, end of, by the end of standard five because now we're talking about things like um, uh, if there's any changes to agreed services, an RTO will advise the learner as soon as practical. But it's um, all about your consumer rights. Have you been is, told up front about it how it all works? It is in, in, that. Are you given it in writing? Yeah. And are any amendments or changes once you've signed on the dotted line? In, yeah. Are what's you informed? Your and what's your redress yes. in the event of yes. etc. So that's what they covered. You know things like policies, procedures, fees, cancellation, payment options and terms. Yep. Um, well, that's the only one through. that was. We added was prior to the course any learner support. They didn't ask that question. Was there any and separate to the LLN? Is there any specific learner support that they might need yeah. prior to the course? Yeah. We do the yeah, LLN well, that when they're enrolled. Well yes. So that was one that we added in. Um, and of course, they did personal protection resources and sort of stuff in their industry. Yep. That's what we asked of the students. Should we move to the? Well, I had one oh, more. Sorry, one more question. Prior to the course, we asked to provide information. Um, LLN, ID, that kind of thing. Very generic question. Is the to determine whether they're on the right level of course or, or to, to have results can't preclude them from undertaking the course. It's a guide to lecture about the level of support we give them. And we might need to adjust and modify. But if they don't necessarily, is it not a case of looking at if they they may have, although there may not be a prerequisite to the course, if they, for instance, got English as a second language or they've got particular learning difficulties, it may be that their, their LLL needs are greater than the, what they've got to be required to perform within that course. So, so we wouldn't have done that information quite often prior to our LLM for us. So our, uh, we run courses for culturally and linguistically diverse where English is their second language. Um, and then what would normally take a day delivery, they have three days. So that's how we offer that specified support to that particular group of learners. So you've adjusted the amount of training with the knowledge of that so like group. Or enrolment, prior to enrolment, yeah. yeah. You can do that prior yes. to enrolment to find out where they're at. So, 
and yeah, then you, you do the unit selection, the then you do the selection. Yeah. And you've yeah. got to remember the majority yeah. of our clientele is schools. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we've already got that information. Yeah. And they've been vetted, for want of a better word. Yeah, we have their good information. Yeah. Um, to see if they've got it. It's prior to enrolment. Or so that you can make necessary recommendations on units or adjustments to the, adjust the training style or the length of oh, you said the length of time. Or provide, you know, in some instances they might get um, uh, CAV support, which, yep. and, you know, other things in a con, yep. you know, enrolment. Absolutely. And, and as you said, it's not just LLN because, like, we have students that are absolutely petrified to touch a coffee machine. So it's not anything to do with the language literature numeracy. They just can't. They, they're too scared. So we're putting another unit into their training package so that they can do that one instead of doing that one. Still yeah. meet the needs. So you're yeah. providing yeah. everything to the learner. Although yeah. that, of course, impacts on the industry expectation. That's the other thing that we have to be mindful of. Yes. Is that yeah. Then you know the, the, the question mark is if they haven't fulfilled that particular <laughs> unit. Does that change what the industry expectation that is? Yeah, yeah. And, then yeah. Yeah. and they're not going to work like, the, especially our industry is so broad. They yes. work in an industry in an establishment that doesn't even have a coffee. But here's the question: mark, most of them will come with their cert four or their cert yeah. three or their cert two or whatever. Yeah. Without having the transcript there as well. There's an assumption. A cert three is a cert three is a yeah. cert three and yeah. the totality. So it does yeah. actually have some impact when we're yeah. talking about industry expectation. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the adjustment doesn't actually then impact. The relevance of that of that qualification. So it's not easy always it's not. to balance these and things. And we have schools that are doing a cert two in hospitality that have no industry equipment and no stainless steel benches, no nothing, and they're doing it just a purely doing a theoretical based hospitality. And we just choose the units that they can do with the equipment that's required for them, and they can they can do it. But then they've never been in an industry yes. or so never been. In I've hired yeah. you because you've got the certificate. Yeah, because basically you've never been in the theory of hospitality, yes. but not it's, a, it's always a, a problem and this is I think sometimes where the industry then gets cranky and says you say that they're confident, how do you prove that? But that's but why you do industry engagement yeah. and what to say what does that yeah. mean? And what you say industry is to be happy. Exactly. Right, so that's or even, okay. even making sure that industry actually understands to ask for a transcript. Yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So that because there are so many variations precisely. of all qualifications, precisely. And, precisely. and you know, just saying, oh yeah, I've got this uh, in in whatever underwater basket weaving doesn't necessarily and mean that's that they service can do. that we can offer to industry. Yeah. Yeah. Making sure that they're mindful of things like that. One point one three and one point one six was us. So we've got that one. Two point two. That was me. Okay. I went to the guys here. I'm just going to, I just took a picture so I can read out what they did. <laughs> so they asked questions is, were the resources adequate? So that it's talking about um, the RTO systematically monitors the RTO's training and assessment strategies and practices to ensure ongoing compliance with standard one and then evaluates the outcomes of those that review to uh, make sure that it's up to date their tasks, basically. So they asked questions like, um, were the resources adequate? Was the hours of trend of delivery sufficient? Was RPL offered? Did the learners, no trainers and assessors have the current knowledge and skills? Has there been any changes to legislation? Were they offered LN support? Were the requirements for the course clearly outlined? And were the assessment requirements slash something Process. processes explained and how? So okay. how was that directed That's at? That's just about to <laughs> I don't know. That's so, the next question anyway. So I'm guessing that is who they, who would they ask that to? Yeah. Well, there's, there's quite a range of different so it's, the training, so it's related to the training assessment strategy. So they're taking the training assessment strategy out and saying, were the resources adequate? On this training assessment strategy, are the resources adequate? So I would be asked, who do we ask? We would ask our trainers and assessors. We would ask um, our employers and or it is it standard too about um, quality assuring things? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the operations of the RTI are quality assured. Yeah. Two so point two is doing your um, your your feedback. 
This is post-delivery. So you might be asking your students, the students yes. as to, okay, where, where the facilities are adequate, this where the resources. But, yeah. but then there's yes. also from the employee's perspective. And employment as, satisfaction. And yeah. post-assessment validation as well. That yeah. Yeah. Mm. And then what do you do when you've got some feedback? How you can, what do you do with that feedback? Do with so how do you, you just you take feedback or do you actually take it on board, process it and actually move forward on it? There's so many places do that feedback. Don't do that. What records have you got? What do you do? How do you ensure that it's changed? and validation as well. So that would need to be again from a range of the stakeholders, so the students, the employers, you could even, I don't know whether yeah. parents would be involved in that. As to, in some cases you might get feedback and you might get feedback as an organisation um, from the number of enrolments and completions. So yeah. that would tell you something about how yeah. successful the training is if you're getting and if you're getting, you know, your dropout rate or your completion rate or something along those lines. Offered. Um, but even for trainers, you know, do they do their own evaluation at the end of their training periods? You know, what do they do with that? How do they? What would they do differently? How do they feed back into the team? What does the team then do with that? Yeah. What do and, our, that, and that's the thing because it, it, quite often there seems to be all those systems in place where you're gathering that feedback and generating that reflection and everything else, and then it just kind of becomes stagnant. And, and it's, it's what is so it's all very important, very well doing all of that. If nothing is then put in place and then you're really not asking you to to to, to be able to show the show how, how what do you do, do, you do? Yeah. 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 yeah show how you found out that this didn't work or what whatever people were not happy about something yeah. what have you done about it have yeah. you made some change to that yeah. or not as the case may be it's acting on the feedback that's been given which doesn't always happen no. Variety. Well, it's hard to keep track of things. Okay. Should we move on to 1.3 and 1.7? Is that you? Yeah. Well, um, so this was looking at 1.3 um, is about whether we've got sufficient assessors, facilities, all those bits and pieces. Right. So from our, from what I sort of jotted down. From, from, we do um, within our organisation is we do we have a venue equipment checklist um, where we go out and assess the facilities of the venues that we're going into whether that's venues in industry or schools that we're going into to check on the facilities as, as we said to, to then draw up a, a training a qualification that meets those requirements but that's only one area of it it's then looking at as it says here trainers and assessors are there sufficient trainers and assessors is there is there one teacher delivering to x amount of students have they got sufficient resources so what questions do you ask so do we tell me have, a list of questions <laughs> do we have enough trainers to suit your needs so whether you've got um, night shifts, fly in, fly out, um, the availability of trainers and assessors to meet the requirements of the client. And if you've only got one is, person, what happens if they fall under a bus, yeah. Yeah. for example? Or go on long service leave or something happens yeah. and they're no longer available. And the plans in place and those bits and pieces. The, the main, the sort of... The, the general consensus was with it, it's like a training needs analysis. You're looking at, you know, have we got sufficient people to, to cover the requirements of the client? So, so, so that's trainers and assessors. Do your employees require any additional assistance? Is there anything specific to your business which we need to cover? So industry specific or employer specific? 
and how many, yeah, the amount of um, students, etc., in order to deliver to. Actually, there wasn't a question there about facilities, but facilities is mentioned in that. Would this not also though be a case where the industry that would be engaging with would be our regulatory body? Because it's actually showing that we have the, the correct, the appropriate amount of facilities and so on to actually to run this. I mean, I think it would be a, a legitimate first question an auditor would ask, for example, can you do these things or do you have the, the, the personnel or the... Right yeah, yeah, exactly. Say, hey, exactly. So yeah. I think that we have a, an industry responsibility to regu uh, yeah. regulate regulatory bodies. have enough well. persons to meet your needs. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 But if you're not actually in industry as such and you're doing simulation, what about your equipment in, in a simulated environment? Have you got yeah. what is required and yeah. what's stated in the training package or the qualification or the units that you need to meet? So. Simulator is one of those scary words, isn't it? We can mean anything to yeah. you. Very often that what I'm finding and within the school environment. The word simulated with replicate. So replicate the workplace. Yeah. Yeah. Still a replicated workplace implies that it is like a workplace and exactly. it's not just a classroom exactly. where yeah. there's a yeah. yeah. Much better wording. Yeah. They haven't done that to hospitality yet. No, because you've got those really specific lists of things that have to be there. Lots yeah. of other training programs don't have that. But I think, yeah. but it always says still a simulated industry environment or a, or, yeah. or a yes. thing. And yeah. I, yeah. I think replicated is yeah. so yeah. much better. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. the, the issue that I'm finding within the schools when I'm going out to do, do sign-ups, we have the venue equipment checklist, which is a list of equipment, etc. for each of the units, coupled that with um, the the teacher, trainer, assessor, qualifications and numbers of trainers and assessors, but then the, the crux tends to be is the number of students within a classroom mm. as to industry would, you know, with regards to space, that's specified within the requirements, yeah. Yeah. but the argument is, well, our mainstream classes are 22, but that, that doesn't... you doing maximum 12 to 15 or something. And that is, that is the battle that we're, we're having, mm. is that, you know... Mm. Yeah. So how are you yeah. going in terms of getting your, who do we ask down? So one, 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 one more? Okay. okay. Couple of minutes. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, sorry. Sorry. What, do you have any required equipment resources? Who are we asking this to? This is to the um, employers. The, the, the club. Well, they, they were talking, I'm not sure his background, but it was the, the client who they're, yeah, who they're going client. to. So the in our, my situation, it would be the school. Yeah, the client, the employers, um, school. Um, for our trainees, it would be the employers. And then obviously 1.7 yeah. is the learner support bit. So 1.7 is the RTO determines the support needs of individual learners and provides access to the education and support services necessary for individual learner to meet the requirements of the training product as specified in the training packages or courses. So their question was, ooh, wrong one. Um, does our LLN test suit your needs? And are you happy to pay for the additional LLN Visibility and support the questions that were asked. Um. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So is that just down to Eleanor, no, the learner support? Because, I mean, there's necessary support, like our mentoring, and yeah. it's not. It isn't just limited to LLN. No. No, no, no. It's any disability, it learning disability, or it does It just says so well, it's 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 identified support that the learner would need, whatever that might could be. be. It could be like students that have um, moved from the country to the city and the support networks because they don't know anybody. It could be they don't drive, so we need to find them a venue that to work out that is within public transport times or a, 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 you know that kind yeah. of support rather than language literacy. It's, me, it's meeting it's learner a, needs. It's a variety of it's not, just LLN, it's not just LLN, but that was all that was focused on. What the, the uh, so have you identified any other support needs? Yeah. Of your yes. What are the support needs that you 
discovered. Quite often for us, where we do get more mature students, it's that fear of not having studied or worked Absolutely. for 20 years. Barriers. Yeah, all those barriers, that's right. So it's or it might be childcare. Yeah, managing care, managing care, yeah, yeah. You know, school. Yeah, going um, back to being an apprentice and get being an apprentice wage and trying to work and juggle that. And, and manage a family, manage a family or whatever, at a mature yeah. age. So that comes back to individual student needs. Yeah, exactly. So it's, it's not just. It's not just as students as a, as a cohort, it's as individuals. It's also, you know, if your parents, you've got school drop off and pick up, so you're coming to train yeah. and you've got this, how, how's that going to impact on what you're doing? Exactly. Yeah, I, didn't, I didn't actually look at that when they were talking about that because, yeah, it, it's, it's, it includes LLM, but it in, involves so, so much yeah. more support. Okay, 1.1. We'll do 1.1. I'll, I'll just take you through what they were talking about and try to sort of sharpen this down a bit. Um, they were very obliging. They said that all of the first four questions up there they thought were legitimate questions to answer 1.1. So, so they just plus one, one additional question, one, one additional uh, question, which is, what is your expectation? Okay, so what is it? And this was all addressed from industry-based, uh, employer-based needs. So, so that's so the So the the who to in both of these was to the employer. So you have that as a reference. Yep, that's one point one you said. And that was one point one. And one point two. Apparently, I can't work my thing out here. Uh, there is question A, B. Anyway, there's another. I'll just give you the questions. Um, what are your employees your employees' current skills, and what skills do you require your employee to have? So it's about skills gaps and uh, T T and A's really. Um, what time do you want the training to be conducted over? So is it going to be blocked learning, or is it going to be over a course of a year, or whatever it happens to be? What current qualifications do your employer cohort have? Um, and so again, it's probably also addressing outdated skills and things like that as well. Um, what is the skill set that they're going to need ultimately in their organisation? So it's about being able to match what have they got and where do they need. Yeah, to and also that sometimes the, the title of the unit doesn't necessarily reflect what <laughs> really? the actual unit really? is all about. <laughs> so, so just about there. So it means that you know trying to help employers. Um, choose the actual units that they need, not yeah. the ones that it seems like they needed. Yeah. And what, is, what are the essential units that your qualification will need? How's that? We just digest for a couple of years. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess it's a consultation it, it, it process. Depends, yeah. 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 It's going to depend. Uh, well, if, if we I'm know what they need, again, again, they're asking the industry and employers. It's about the need, the needs and wants, but also to, to ensure that, that we're maintaining so the integrity of the qualification. Is, yeah. is that then, you know, not all of them are actually made, end up achieving what they want them to achieve because of. Yeah, I'll just fill this one in. Okay. Just, just yeah. even the elements okay. in the unit. Yeah. <laughs> So hopefully by this stage what you have is it's quite a list of questions that you can use to and adapt for your own purposes in terms of industry engagement, as well as some ideas around who you might actually be talking to about those things. The next thing that we're going to do is actually figure out how we might then ask those questions. So how are we going to engage with those people? And that's where our coloured matrices come back into play. So in your handout for activity five, you'll have a handout that says methods of sharing information. <laughs> methods of sharing information. So, what the idea is here is that we have popped a few methods in there to give you some ideas about how you might uh, actually gather this information. It is by no means an exhaustive list, it's just a few ideas to get you thinking. What we want you to do in your group is to actually add to that, brainstorm some other ideas for how you might collect information rel relative to the questions that you have written down and the people that you are going to ask those questions to. So, for
for example, if you have said that you are going to ask a particular type of question to your students, if you have a, a, a smaller group of students, let's say you might have 10 or 15 students, then you might decide um, that maybe you might go and talk to them. If you have 10,000 students, you might not do that. You might choose a different way. If your students are geographically dispersed, how are you going to access them? So the method that you're going to use very much depends on who it is that you're engaging with. And so think about other ideas. Think about the pros and cons of each of those methods and think about what is actually going to suit you. Okay. And so you've got 20 minutes to do that activity. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, invite some feedback from our webinar participants at the moment and we are going to also ask some questions here. So while they're writing in the chat box, I'm going to ask the same question of, of you. So what I want you to do is to give us some examples from your worksheets around the question you are asking, who you're going to ask it to and how you're actually going to ask it for your client groups. So for each of your groups, we really just want you to pick one question that you have got and explain the pathway that you've taken with this. What's the question? Who are you going to ask it to and how are you going to ask it? So our webinar people type that in the chat box and then do we have a volunteer group who's going to give us an example? Yeah, you only have to pick one. Yep, down the front here. Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Where's that sneaky microphone? I think I understand what you've got. Yeah. Uh, one point two. So we have. So, push. so can just pay attention. Thank you. So the question is for one point two. What are your employees' current skills? So for us, we'd be asking. Sorry, sorry, Joe. I'm going to interrupt you. Can we have your attention here? Thank you. Go, Joe. Okay, 1.2. So the question is, what are your employees' current skills? So that's the question we'd be asking to our supervisors, managers, line managers, team leaders, because they're the they're the crux of who yep. are dealing with the people on the ground. Regardless yep. of industry, that could apply to, and now I'm talking off the top of my head, that could apply to both a um, mechanical supervisor at a workshop yep. floor. It could also apply to a business leader in the workplace. Great. So. Yep. Um, the best way to do that, I think, is actually a face-to-face -face question. Yes. Go there, have a meeting, get some rapport because yes. they're the people that you really need to yes. have a relationship with yes. to keep that longevity going yep. because they're going to help drive your industry and your training practices and methodologies. Agreed. So. Fantastic. Thank you. Another volunteer down the back? Oh. <laughs> 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 The hand is going up, you volunteer. Sold. <laughs> uh, okay, so one of the questions, uh, were the assessment requirements processes explained? That's usually through the declaration form and the initial consultation. Okay. So that's what we're And you're going to ask put. that question to? To the students. Students. Yep. Participants. Yes. Yep. So yes. Yep. And so then also obviously getting feedback as well from the participants uh, yeah. to see if your resources and everything were adequate, yeah. uh, were they current, were yeah. they working properly. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. And again, so that's a situation that very much depends on how your organisation is structured as to how you would ask those questions. So if you had a small student group, you might actually sit and have a debrief session with them where you talk about those types of questions. If you have a significant cohort that may be spread around, it's something where you might send a survey to them. So you're asking the same questions to the same people, but using a different methodology to do it. Fabulous. Thank you. Bob? No, nothing yet, I'm afraid. No responses. Oh, dear. We better have another one from here. Maybe. Another group want to volunteer? No, Sophie, you just volunteered. <laughs> What is new now? The trends, technology, customer needs, industry so changes, and we have one point one three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we, that's the kind of questions we're asking, and we were going to ask that to industry and employers, and we do that face to face via emails and feedback forms. Okay. 
Okay. So there's lots and lots of different ways that we can we can get that information and for you as organisations you have to figure out what's going to work for you and your client groups. So there's not going to be one set way in which you do this. Hopefully that message is coming through loud and clear. There's also not going to, oh, <laughs> yay, we have someone from online, thanks Bob. The damn, the damn burst. Okay. <laughs> Okay, um, Sharon Ross has said, we have, ha have we included sufficient details in these scenarios to ensure that they capture the complexity of real life, yeah. clients and contexts, yeah. in brackets aged care, face-to-face yeah. -face discussion and review of scenarios with support workers, yeah. EN, RN, who have direct contact with range of clients. Yeah. I guess that's nurses, is it, yeah. ENRN? Yeah. Uh, Debbie Payne says to HR personnel, I would ask what are current skills of employees, what are skills needed, and develop from these answers. Yeah. Uh, Shona Andrews has said, what are the pathways they want for their staff? Who, industry manager, yeah. what are the future trends they are looking at employing in the future? Yeah. How F to F? Face to face, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, thank you. So we've talked about what we're going to ask, we've talked about who we're going to ask, we've talked about how we're going to ask, now we're going to talk about when we're going to ask these questions. And you actually have this diagram in your handouts and what it's representative of is the life cycle of a qualification. So typically what happens here is some need that actually drives us to move into designing a training program for an individual, an organisation or, or a community. And we'll go through a bit of an analysis phase where we look at what the true need is, what the scope of it is, who we might actually be going to offer this to, all of the things that actually might drive the design development type stages. So we figure out exactly what we're supposed to do and then would go ahead and design a, a program that would enable that to happen. So out of this, you would have all of your teaching materials, the materials you would give to your learner, your assessment tools, marking guides. You would get whatever resources you needed. It might be facilities, it might be equipment. That all kind of happens in here. Then you go away and teach it. And once you're teaching, you, you're moving into an evaluative type cycle. So you'll be watching things as they're happening here and then you will certainly look at what worked and what didn't work afterwards and, and this is a cycle that just keeps going. Yeah. So sometimes the things feed in from outside that might change what you do but generally <laughs> like legislation changes for example. Yeah. Generally this cycle uh, is just like a, a rolling wheel. So when we think about industry engagement and what we realise is that it doesn't just happen at one part of the process. It in fact happens throughout that cycle. So again, thinking about the questions that you are going to ask, who you're going to ask them to, how you're going to do it. Now think about when you will do it in your cycle. So let me give you a couple of examples to think about. Let's say you offer a first aid training. It's typically short or shorter, about three days usually. Yes? No. <laughs> three days, right? Yes. <laughs> and if you're in a bigger organisation, you know, most organisations will run one or two of these courses every week. So when you look at the bulk of students and, and when they might then engage with their students and the employers and the trainers and assessors, all those other people, that's the situation that you might deal with. Then I think back to this, these lovely people that I've met through the audit process uh, who um, are naturopaths. And their diploma qualification runs for two years and they never have any more than 10 students. So when do they ask these questions? So the time scales that you will have depending on what you do and how you do it 
are also likely to be quite different. So as you think about this when, think about it for you. When are you going to do these things? What makes sense for your organisation in terms of the when questions? So you have uh, about 15 minutes. Let's make that 10 minutes to actually think about when you might ask these questions in that cycle and at what frequency you might ask them. So as I moved around the group, what the majority of you were saying was, well, this is going to happen all the time and it is going to happen all the time. And the reality for you is that there'll be some planned points at which you're going to do particular things that will always be the case, but there's always also going to be an element of reaction in there. So as things come up, pop up, you and as people tell you and give you information, you will engage in more of those types of activities. So the when is it's a it's a constant way uh, of working really the engagement with the different stakeholders at the appropriate times within your cycle. So on that A3 handout that you had, there's one empty column left. Records. <laughs> now, so in the uh, hundreds of questions that came through to us before the session, I would say about a third of them were, what records do I have to keep? Okay. Yes. Now, <laughs> I feel I can almost ask you that question now and you would be able to answer it for me. Yeah? yeah? yeah. yeah. Well, you'd be showing them the surveys you sent out. <laughs> Well you, well, you just have to be able to prove by your collaboration would be your meeting minutes, um, your surveys to your core stakeholders, yeah. uh, how they came back, what time frame, yeah. um, if you've got a strategy in place that you use for your business, where in the strategy, yeah. you, the different surveys or face-to-face -face meetings, who you allocate them to, mm -hmm. then that person, you would ask them to take notes and make sure they came back. If they went off to a seminar, you'd want to find out what they did yep. instead of just saying I went to an online yep. webinar you'd have yep. to say well what is it and keep a record of that yep. on a register but make it with attachments now much more with attachments. <laughs> with attachments. <laughs> I, think, I think too the evidence is just anything to make sure that you can tick off the who, the what, the where, the why, the when, the use it. Do you know what I mean? It, it doesn't matter what it is, but as long as you've got something for each one of those sort of questions that we've been working on, well, that's your records. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So the records are going to be different for everyone. Yeah. The records are going to be different. Yeah. So what we're really interested in is what was the plan? Mm. Like how did you actually plan to do this? Did you have a strategy that you're going to implement? When you did that, because that that's a pretty important one. That's <laughs> one we. We see, we see all these nice plans and, str and that could be for a plan for validation. And then we say, what did you do? And they go, oh, we were too busy. We didn't do any of it. <laughs> so you've got a plan for engagement. What did you actually do? When you went out and you did these surveys and you had these meetings and you did these interviews, what information came back to you? And then the next thing is, what did you actually do with what you collected? Yes. Yeah? That's the killer. In the it it is. is. Yeah, and so it can be as simple as here we were talking about, it can be as simple as the notes that you put in the version control, like if you updated uh, an assessment tool and put a new scenario, and you can say assessment tool changed, updated scenario to reflect current practice. You know, it can be as simple as that. So your recording of, of attendance is actually the easy part on any of these sorts of where you're upgrading where you your skills, went. where you went. I mean, Eventbrite, thank you very much. Yeah. It records everything. Yeah. TRBWA for teachers, you know, yeah. record everything on there. Yeah. Um, but it's what you do at the end. Exactly. And that's the bit that is inevitably missing. Mm -hmm. Being able to see what you have done with this information that you have collected. 
So sometimes you're going to collect a whole lot of information and what it will do is validate what you are already doing, in which case you say thank you. And other times what it will do is say there really needs to be some change in either the skill level of your staff or the materials that you're using or the general approach, in which case you demonstrate through your improvement process. Yeah. Okay. So the records really have to, to tell us what were you planning to do, what information did you get back, what did you do with it? And it's that last one that you're not good at doing, generally. What did you do with it? Okay. So there's, I'm sorry, there's no one form we're going to send you. <laughs> That's going to fix all of this. I mean, in law, as a lawyer, you, yep. you're billable time. Yep. So a lawyer sits there, I'm oh, sorry, a lawyer sits there and every time they chat to you, it costs you money and they write everything out yeah. or they record it. Yes. That's the perfect scenario for recording mm. and then from that they obviously analyse what they did with that time they spent with you yeah. so they've got to justify yeah. it. Yeah. And a way to record and, and justify. And if that is um, something that you would choose to do, you can do it yeah. if you want to. Yeah. There's other ways to do it too. So some, some people are very good at, you know, keeping those kinds of notes. And and so, for example, you know, a lot of people have, uh, there was a lady yesterday in, in the group who was writing notes and when you had a look at the notes that she was writing, they actually told a story of what, she's a writer, <laughs> you know, that's how she does it. it. It worked really well for her. It's not necessarily going to work for her all of us because our brains don't function like that. We've had um, clients in our other arm um, of bookkeeping and accounting mm. that now say I'm going to tape this conversation mm. because I've been misled, misguided, mm. had problems before, mm. I want actual mm. proof mm. of what you're saying is what's going mm. to get done, mm. moving down the track, they've changed account and they've changed whatever yeah. Yeah. and they've been burnt. Yep. and they want proof of that. Yep. So that's another option. You go into a meeting yep. where you're talking and you're covering so much information, as long as yep. you tell them first yes. that this is for your records exactly. so that you can go back and, and act on it. Would you, you mind if I recorded this? Yeah, we'll record send it. you a transcript. Yeah. Fine. Another way to do it. So for some industries that will work nicely, for other industries it won't. That will be very offensive. So it, it, it is really about Picking. picking what's right, really what's right for you. And I would stress this idea of naturally occurring evidence. So for example, the lady who was writing yesterday, we're not going to, because it's such a lovely story that she's written, all the information that she needed was in that notebook that she writes in every day. There's no requirement whatsoever for her to go back and type that up into a thing that's got industry consultation written. Waste of time. That works for her. For other organisations where maybe you actually have to share a lot of information, then there would have to be a way that you take that and are able to share it amongst lots of people. So you're actually going to do this in different ways. So it's got to suit your clients and yourself in the organisation. Yep. Okay. So, after all this, we come down to having a little bit of time. We've got about 15, well, actually about 10 minutes to think about what would actually work for you. So as you take in all the information that we've actually talked about today, and I know there's been a lot that we have talked about, how could you distill that down into something that would actually be an appropriate strategy for your organisation? And you have this handout uh, on your desks. So what you'll see in there in that handout is we've picked out like the main types of activities that we typically associate with uh, industry engagement. And you've got a little bit of space there to think about and, and make notes about those kinds of key activities that might sit in a strategy for you. Now, obviously, in this time frame of 10 minutes, 
you know, all you're going to do is get broad brush strokes. What we want you to do is to think about that broad brush and then take it back to your organisations and say, let's develop this into a coherent strategy for our organisation. Okay. So I want to give you 10 minutes to think about all we've talked about, distill it down into what you think is going to work for you. You've had a lot of information that has come to you uh, today and we're very aware that that, that is the, the case. Uh, so we have now a, a few minutes. Uh, if there were any particular questions that you would like to ask uh, around the content of today's session. Anyone got any questions? Yes. Yes. Um, I'm going to advocate that one of the serious things that we do need to engage with industry and in particular clients is objectives and outcomes, the measurement of outcomes, the measurement and the setting of goals, yes. something that's uh, sadly lacking uh, in yes. our industry. Yes. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Questions or comments? <laughs> Okay, I'd just like to say that I think the way you explained things so far is laid out really nicely, broken it down into real simple little bite-sized chunks, made it di digestible for us to understand, gave us a few little insights to the future, yeah. and hopefully now we'll all go away and be 100% compliant on this subject. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're going to go back because we have our Summer Shorts program uh, coming out soon on the, the 1st of December. That is a, it's an online forum and there's a copy of the program on the table for you. So if you haven't already enrolled, have a look at that uh, program that's on the table. There's all kinds of interesting you know, little presentations that are going to be done uh, on that day and hopefully we will see some of you there. So I want to say thank you for being such a participative group and, and being cooperative because I know we asked you to do an awful lot today and it is uh, Wednesday after all. It's a very tough ask on a Wednesday. So thank you and I look forward to seeing you uh, out there in, in Vetland, whether it be in this kind of forum or maybe with a different hat on. So thanks for today and good luck with uh, the things that you are doing. Thank you. Thank you.